BPI 20. Mm -hmm. So it's a pleasure to be here to uh, honor Gobind Karana. Uh, uh, and uh, his many contributions. I think I'm in the minority as a speaker because I've never worked with uh, Karana uh, and I've never worked with anybody that did work with Karana. <laughs> Nor have I worked at any institution where Karana works. <laughs> but, uh, but I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the pioneering work that he did almost 50 years ago in the early 60s. Um, uh, the work I'm going to present has to do with uh, synthesizing whole bacterial chromosomes and obviously uh, we wouldn't be doing this if uh, he hadn't laid the foundations for that. And I, I think he's probably amazed by how far things have gone. So. Uh, for our purposes, we define a synthetic cell as one that operates off of a chemically synthesized genome. And uh, we like the computer analogy that a genome of a cell is the operating system and the cytoplasm is the hardware. The cytoplasm has all of the constituents, ribosomes and so on that are required to express the uh, information encoded in the genome. Um, neither one by itself can do much. A little historical perspective, uh, Karana we consider to be the father of gene synthesis. He developed methods for chemical uh, synthesis of DNA in the early 60s and synthesized the first gene, a tRNA gene in 1970. Of course, since, uh, since that time, there's been a tremendous improvement in the rate at which one can make uh, uh, synthesized genes. Um, and it's quite easy now to synthesize uh, virtually any viral genome. They're well within reach. The cost of synthesis has dropped uh, dramatically. And it's now possible to uh, uh, synthesize small bacterial chromosomes. Moore's law seems to be operating. Uh, when I became interested in gene synthesis while at Celera, uh, if you wanted to order a gene from a company, it was around $12 a base. Now the companies are selling uh, gene-sized pieces of DNA for about 50 or 60 cents a base, base pair. So it's, uh, you can order up pretty much what you want. Now, <clears throat> we're not clever enough to design a genome from first principles. Whatever we design probably wouldn't work. Uh, so it, uh, to, to us, it made better sense uh, four or five years ago when we were contemplating making a bacterial genome. It made better sense to pick a small one, a natural genome that we knew would work and uh, simply mark it so that we would know it was the one that we made. <clears throat> uh, we chose the uh, bacterium Mycoplasma genitalium, which has the smallest known genome of any uh, bacterium that you can grow in culture in the laboratory. And uh, uh, <clears throat> we sequenced that genome in 1995 uh, at Tiger. It had 485 protein coding genes and 43 RNA genes. Uh, studies by Clyde Hutchison at Tiger in the late 90s and by John Glass uh, in 2005 and 6 showed that there are about 100 of the protein genes that you can knock out one at a time without uh, affecting the growth of the organism. And, uh, uh, however, all the RNA genes appear to be essential. Uh, so part of our motivation in getting into this uh, whole project of synthesizing a uh, genome in a synthetic cell was our interest in making a minimal cell. And I think at some stage we'll get back onto that. 
this is mycoplasma in a scanning EM. It's uh, very small, it's about 300 nanometers across. It has a definite structure due to its internal cytoskeleton. It has a little uh, neck and head that attaches to uh, human epithelial cells. Unfortunately, it grows very slow, slowly in the laboratory. Uh, you can get colonies on an auger plate in two to three weeks. The doubling time is about 16 hours, so in some ways it's not an ideal organism. Anyway, we decided to uh, synthesize this genome. And the idea was to simply start with uh, oligonucleotides that overlapped each other, put them together into subassemblies. Uh, until we got to about 100 overlapping sections which we could uh, recombine together to assemble the complete uh, genome, which we thought we could probably uh, move into a recipient cell in such a way that we displaced the recipient chromosome so that the synthetic one would take over. Uh, so we were all set to go ordering a lot of oligonucleotides and Craig uh, came in and said, no, no, uh, let's get this thing going. Uh, so probably one of the best things that happened to us, he said, okay, we're gonna buy 100 pieces from the gene companies because they're, they're automated, they're set up to do this stuff very quickly. So we uh, ordered, primarily from three different companies here uh, to make five or six KB pieces that overlap by about 80 bases. And um, it was up to us to develop methods to assemble those into the complete genome. Uh, we worked up this scheme. Uh, initially, we would put four of the uh, six KB pieces together to make 24 KB, and then three at a time to make eighth molecules, and then two at a time to make uh, uh, quarter genome size pieces, and then on up to halves and uh, the whole. And initially we thought we would do all this in the test tube. Uh, we worked up a uh, an assembly strategy that uh, was reasonably good. Uh, for example, you have four overlapping pieces, you chew back with an exonuclease to expose the overlaps and then just anneal them together and repair. A fairly simple reaction. And we wanted to do that assembly in the presence of, of the vector so that we could immediately transform and get clones. Uh, so we used a, uh, a back vector and simply by PCR, we were able to add uh, overlaps with the two ends of the assembly. So our actual assemblies here at this stage used five, five pieces. And uh, <clears throat> it was quite efficient. Uh, at the first assembly, all of the colonies had the correct size. And then uh, when we got up to uh, one-eighth molecules and quarter molecules, it was still uh, quite efficient. We had no trouble getting um, these uh, pieces. So we uh, got to the stage of quarter molecules and we got hung up there. We couldn't, uh, the, the reaction, the assembly reaction would not uh, give us any clones of half molecules. And we didn't know what the problem was, whether we had reached the limit of what you could clone in coli, or um, <clears throat> perhaps it was of the size that we were actually breaking the molecules when, when we tried to handle them. So uh, we uh, decided to turn to yeast, which has a reputation for being able to clone very large pieces up to a couple of megabases. So we purified each of the quarter molecules, uh, quarter genomes from E. coli, threw them into an Eppendorf tube. We cleaved one of them with a unique uh, cutting enzyme, BSMB1, and then we used a uh, uh, yeast cloning vector to which we had uh, PCR'd on overlaps 
to the ends here. So we had six pieces total, and we simply um, added those to uh, yeast spheroplasts uh, and uh, played it out to see if we got any uh, assemblies. And uh, in fact, about 10% uh, or more of the clones that we obtained uh, had a complete genome. And we picked one of these, you can see here, uh, the genome was flanked by not one size, so we could excise the vector, and here's the, uh, the genome here. Um, we went ahead and picked one of these and did a complete sequencing. 15x coverage of it, and, it, and the sequence matched exactly the one that we designed. We had no mistakes in it. We still don't know if that would work, of course, but it, it was what we designed. And we published that in Science. Um, the two key people in the lab, uh, Dan uh, was instrumental in, in the in vitro assembly, and Gwen um, uh, did the uh, yeast work. Uh, so when that was, uh, came out in the journal, the journalists came up uh, and said, look, at, there's nothing to look at here. Can you give us something we can show the reader? So uh, uh, Clyde went, uh, he extracted the uh, genome out of yeast and uh, went to our fluorescent microscope, uh, stained the um, genome DNA with cyber gold and looked in the microscope. Here's a time lapse uh, of uh, six frames of one of the uh, uh, sort of compacted circular uh, genitalium genomes. There were many of those. Okay, so as typical in science, you work hard. We worked two years getting this thing together. And then uh, very soon after that, we developed two methods which would have reduced it to a couple of months. Uh, one was the development of an isothermal in vitro reaction using a five prime exonuclease rather than a three prime, so that it's not completing with the polymerase. Uh, and the other was to, uh, at the first stage of test tube assembly, we just take the 25 pieces, throw them into yeast, and they all come together. Um, so the isothermal method uh, is really very nice. You have your reagent buffer mix with triphosphates and so on, um, essentially contained in 15 microliters that you just thaw out of, uh, from your freezer. And you add five microliters of your mixture of DNA fragments, uh, incubate at 50 degrees for 15 minutes, uh, or 15 to 30 minutes, and then uh, uh, by that time uh, you've chewed back and, and they come together in a circle. And the circle, the circular DNA is resistant to all of the enzymes in the mixture so it accumulates, whereas any of the linear products eventually uh, can get degraded. And that actually works with the, uh, to make half molecules, uh, which it turns out we could clone in coli. Um, and then the next thing, and this is work done by Dan Gibson, um, we, uh, uh, since we could apparently put together six pieces rather easily, we figured why not, you know, do more? So we thought, well, we go back to here, and Dan said, well, let's just go back to here, take these 25 pieces that we had uh, in our um, uh, refrigerator, <clears throat> and uh, just uh, introduce those uh, into yeast. Uh, one of the pieces uh, contains the uh, uh, yeast uh, centromeric plasmid. Uh, so just equal amounts of these 25 pieces uh, were transformed into yeast spheroplasts where they uh, uh, make their way into the nucleus and uh, assemble and you get a complete genome. Uh, we did uh, 
PCR analysis both across the junctions and for each of the pieces to show they were all there. And uh, we also showed that the uh, uh, genome has the same size as expected. So uh, these things make, uh, if we want to synthesize another gene, make it very, a uh, genome make it very uh, much more quickly done. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have a synthetic uh, M genitalium genome, and we can uh, propagate it in the yeast. Uh, and of course we can extract it from yeast and get it as naked DNA in the test tube, but we have to bring it to life. We have to isolate it and transplant it into a cytoplasm so it can boot up and uh, start producing a synthetic cell. Uh, and uh, so the idea is to the donor cell, in the case of genitalium, would be yeast. You extract the DNA by whatever means. Uh, it's free DNA and then put it into a recipient cell where it displaces the resident uh, chromosome. Um, we had a very naive model for this. You have a recipient cell and you have your naked genome which carries a antibiotic marker here, tetracycline, uh, using uh, standard transformation methods. <clears throat> you introduce it into the recipient cell and then, uh, so you have a uh, presumably a temporary diploid state and then the cell divides and you get two daughter cells, one of which is the synthetic one. <clears throat> then you introduce the tetracycline and kill off the uh, recipient. So you're left with your uh, cell with the synthetic chromosome. Of course, the, all the machinery inside the cell is still that of the original recipient. So the, the phenotype of the cell is still that uh, of the original cell, but now if the genome can be expressed and um, the cell starts dividing, within a few generations you've replaced all of the proteins and membranes and so on from the original recipient and you take on the phenotype of the new cell. And you have uh, what we call a synthetic cell because it's operating from a uh, synthetic genome. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, we wanted to do with it, this with genitalium, but it grows so slowly that we needed a faster model in order to develop the technique of transplantation. So we turned to mycoides and capricolum, and uh, the, uh, they're sufficiently different that we can distinguish the genomes and they double uh, in 90 minutes. So we could do experiments in three or four days. Um, our scheme was as follows. We uh, prepared the recipient cells and put them into calcium chloride. Uh, we uh, isolated the uh, mycoides donor DNA from mycoides cells uh, using auger plugs. And then we added the cells to the DNA and then layered on uh, our uh, transformation cocktail here, PEG, sodium chloride, and so on. Uh, mix gently, and then uh, after some incubation, you plate it out. And initially, we got one or two colonies. We weren't sure it was working, but uh, uh, it improved over the next few months, and we routinely now get one or two hundred of the blue TET colonies. Uh, the genotype is that of the uh, um, donor chromosome, and we actually s sequenced 1X just to make sure we didn't have some sort of mosaic. <clears throat> and the phenotype, at least uh, the phenotype we measured, is that of the, the donor. <clears throat> so I want to emphasize, well, here are the key people for that uh, work. Carol Lartique worked out the uh, method uh, uh, along with uh, Nina and John. 
uh, and John was the leader of the transplant team. <clears throat> I want to point out that transplantation is different from natural transformation. Uh, regular transformation, you, uh, the recipient chromosome stays in the cell. You're just uh, you're adding a plasmid which grows in the cytoplasm or you're recombining a piece of DNA into the recipient. Uh, in the case of transplantation, it's a, uh, it's a clean replacement of the recipient chromosome by the donor. So, uh, <clears throat> our synthetic, the, of course the transplant was done from one cell to another, but our genome is in yeast. Uh, <clears throat> so we wanted to continue with the mycoides capricolum model so we, uh, uh, we needed to transform the mycotes genome into yeast and then uh, propagate it there and then take it out and, and do a transplant out of yeast. So uh, Gwen, uh, who uh, was the key person on our uh, yeast work on the synthesis, um, developed uh, methods to trans uh, to clone uh, genomes into yeast, and we have several different uh, combinations here. And there's several different ways you can do this. <clears throat> so, uh, again, this is to remind you of our overall scheme. We have to extract the DNA out of yeast and uh, <clears throat> put it in. And it didn't work. The thing didn't work. We got the genomes out of yeast, uh, did our standard experimental transplant procedure. We got nothing. And we sweated for a couple of months. And then it occurred to us that it, there might be some restriction phenomena involved here. <laughs> I don't think I was the one that thought of it, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, but we had looked at the genome sequences and there were several restriction systems. Uh, the recipient had one system which was also present in the, in the donor. And that's why when we extracted from donor, it was already methylated so it was protected and that transplant worked. But when we grew the mycoides in yeast, it lost the methylation pattern. So now when we put it into the uh, capricolum, it, it got knocked out. So um, we got a team together to um, prepare methylation extracts and purify the enzymes, <clears throat> and another uh, team to uh, uh, delete the restriction enzyme from the recipient. And uh, so it worked. It was restriction. Uh, when, if you use a uh, restriction minus recipient, it works every time, no matter what the methylation of the donor. Whereas if you uh, use a wild type, which has a restriction system, you have to do the appropriate methylation using uh, either purified enzymes or extracts. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we were pretty pleased it was working. Um, but when we published our original transplantation paper, uh, there were a number of really good scientists that doubted that we actually had it working, you know, contamination or what else. Um, it seemed like an extraordinary result. And uh, so, it occurred to us that if we now modified the genome of mycoides in yeast, changed it to a genome that did not exist in the laboratory or anywhere in nature, and could bring that back to life by transplantation, that would even convince us that it was working. So we uh, uh, carried out uh, genetic uh, manipulations or alterations in yeast here. We uh, replaced the uh, type, uh, type 3 restriction enzyme in the mycoides by this cassette here. And then we cleanly, that gave us a strain here, and then we cleanly uh, removed the cassette here 
So we had three different versions of the uh, yeast uh, genome. And uh, when we looked at the PCR, we got the expected PCRs for those uh, alterations, and our transplant also had exactly the same uh, PCR, so it looked all right. And um, <clears throat> we were getting good transplant with that. So, uh, and uh, we also completely sequenced one of the uh, genomes and it had everything that we expected. <clears throat> so we end up in summary with a uh, kind of a new paradigm here where you uh, introduce the yeast vector into a bacterial genome in such a way that the cell can grow all right. And then you isolate the DNA, put it into yeast, engineer the genome, and then transplant it back to produce a new uh, strain of the bacterium. Uh, <clears throat> and this is particularly valuable uh, in mycoplasmas where you have no genetic tools. So now we can just put the genomes in the yeast, play around with them, transplant them back to cells, and uh, uh, produce uh, a lot of different strains. Um, so I just want to wind up saying that uh, um, <clears throat> we still don't know how to design cells or genomes. That's probably the major thing we're going to have to do. And uh, Craig wanted to give this lecture a few months ago, and he asked his bioinformatics team to come up with a quickie slide that would illustrate um, what a, a gene designer program would look like. And he threw this up on the screen. and. You know, you got the drop-down menus for whatever you want in your new, uh, newly designed genome. And so he ended the talk with that slide, and uh, immediately half a dozen people came running up asking for the software. <laughs> anyway, and here's.